we have assembled with no expense spared, even their bus fares included to get here, starting from the far end there. David Smith, the economic editor of the Sunday Times, former Conservative leader, Conservative MP, leading Brexit backbencher, Ian Duncan Smith, uh, the head of less tax for landlords. I wonder what he stands for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'll think about it. Tony Gimple and the High, high Street residential, Gavin Fraser. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> <clears throat> Let me start, and by the way, I'd like you to get involved as soon as you feel you want to put your hand up. We've got roving mics. Uh, where are they? Let's see where the mics are. We've got one there. We've got one there. And is that it? See? Who said austerity was over? We've only got two mics, but never <laughs> mind. We'll, we'll make do with that. So just put your hand up when you want to say something. Questions would be better than speeches. Um, speeches tend to lead to me calling security. Uh, <laughs> so just get to the point, don't waffle, and let me get to the point. This election and Brexit, let me suggest for discussion, if there's a conservative majority, we're out by the end of January at the latest into the transition period. If there isn't a conservative majority, if there's a Labour minority government, say, it's possible we won't leave at all. Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, yes, I, I agree with that. I think the reality is it may not. If there's a Conservative majority, uh, I saw the Prime Minister yesterday evening. I'm pretty certain his plan is to put his deal back on steroids in, in Parliament with a new speaker uh, who's not John Burko. <laughs> yeah, just wanted to stress that. Leave that for a second. People understood. So uh, yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, uh, oh, I and see then the Berko fan club is here today. Yeah, uh, <laughs> order. <laughs> and then the idea would be to get that through really quickly. So I think actually, if he did, and uh, the European Union would want to do the same, I think it's likely, as they said, uh, we'd be leaving certainly by the first second week of January. I don't think we'd be waiting till the end of January. So it'll be a bit faster than that. That's the plan. Um, and I think he wants to get straight on then with straight into the FTA and the free trade deal. That's a free trade agreement that has to be negotiated yep. by the end of December next year. That's right. So he'd want to start that, get on with it, because we'd have already lost uh, a month and a half okay. as a result of the election. David Smith. Um, well, when we look at the election, and um, you laid out the uh, the parameters uh, in terms of Brexit. Um, it's worth remembering that a, a, a conservative leader has not won a comfortable, in other words, a large majority for over 30 years. The last one was Margaret Thatcher mm -hmm. in 1987. Uh, John Major had a small majority in 1992, and David Cameron had another small majority in uh, 2015. So um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge even with um, uh, somebody as, as well-known and um, somebody who is less unpopular than Jeremy Corbyn, uh, which isn't difficult, uh, as Boris Johnson. So, uh, and I think the, the, the election really does rest on uh, where Brexit Party support falls. If the Brexit Party continues to um, uh, stand, uh, carry out its pledge to stand in most constituencies, um, then the question then is, do they take more votes from the Tories or from, uh, or from Labour? And if they take votes from the Tories, I don't think the Brexit Party will win any seats. Do they take more votes from the Tories? I think we may still be headed into hung Parliament territory, mm -hmm. which, as you say, Andrew, makes the, um, the Brexit outcome very uncertain. And I, I, I think for anybody um, who supports Brexit, um, the Labour alternative, which would be that their softer version of Brexit against Remain uh, would be no choice at all in a referendum. So I think then, then it becomes very, very messy, very, very tricky. Um, I don't want to go on too long, but in, in, you know, no. in, in, in terms of what you were, this, the kind of timetable that you were talking <clears throat> about, Andrew, for a free trade agreement, 
there is no way that is going to be done in 11 months. Uh, Let me come on to that, because yeah. that's okay. another issue. Yeah. Yeah. Let me come on to that. Uh, I, I'm going to bring the other two in a moment. But to Ian Duncan Smith, uh, David Smith, you had to be called Smith to get into that end of this yeah, panel. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ian Duncan Smith, if there's a hung parliament, then it's a Labour government. A hung, there can't be a Tory government in a hung parliament. You've got no friends to form a coalition with. Well, uh, for there, supply and maintenance, you know, it's well, over. I, you stuffed the Liberals in uh, after 2010. Uh, the D, DUP yeah. regard you as toxic after 2017. If it's a hung parliament, it will be up to Jeremy Corbyn to try and put a working government together. I, 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 you know, we can never quite predict how these things work, but I think the reality, though, is two things, and you're right about this. I think this is a very stark choice. This is election for the first time in a while where the choice is really stark. 2017 was messy. Nobody really wanted the election. It was, uh, you know, too soon. This election is really on a different basis. And I think two things about that. I think you're right. I think the fact is that, and this is what Boris Johnson will say, you know, there is only one party that can deliver you Brexit. The other parties are actually opposed to it. Interestingly, I was looking at Keir Starmer's offer today uh, that he was announcing on the radio. He's, he's the shadow yeah, Brexit. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I should explain yes. that. Uh, he's the shadow Brexit secretary for the Labour Party. And his is very subtly and carefully put together so that if they were to win, they would go and renegotiate. But if you find out what they're renegotiating, what they want to do is to have a customs union and a single market. And then when they've got that back in the package, they're then going to go to the country. And of course, you know exactly what will happen. If you're in the single market and the customs union, uh, then they believe that they will all campaign to oppose their own deal on the basis that, of course, you might as well be in the EU because at least you get a vote at that point. Uh, and so the whole thing is planned, and I think David's right on this, of being back in the EU but taking a bit more time to do it. So the reality is, and uh, a comment uh, which you made, which I think is quite right, this election will for a long time, and I think David's point comes in on this one, be a breaking up of the normal tectonic plates of politics. You're right that politics has been peculiar. People have been quite dug in about who they support for some time. This, I think, is going to be really difficult to call because, as you know, in the past, literally a general election has been fought in about 200 seats. That's all. The rest have basically not been fought at all because they were either Labour safe seats or Tory safe seats. But now with the Brexit issue in it, you've got some ABs who might be tempted to go in one direction. You've got C2Ds, the uh, people that would normally maybe vote Labour, now talking in places like the Northwest and the Midlands of abandoning Labour. This is going to be very peculiar. So I don't think anything that's happened in the past is going to be any guide now to where we might be by December the 13th. All right. I know <laughs> is if I wake up staring down the lens to see that bearded face of Mr. Corbyn staring back at me, I think I'm going to pull the covers back over my head. <laughs> yeah. Tony, is it as simple as if the Tories get an overall majority, we leave into a transition period, which I'll come back to in a minute, and if it's a hung parliament with Labour trying to form a minority government, the chances are we'll stay. Discuss. Discuss. Tory majority, we leave. A working majority, we leave. The country can get on, forget about Brexit, and do what we're best at, which is being a free trade zone, a mongrel nation, and bringing the best in and, and outputting the best. If it's not an overall Tory majority, I haven't got a clue, but it's probably not putting the, uh, going back to bed and putting the covers over your head, it's probably being sent to the gulag instead. <laughs> um, it's really polarised. Brexit has been a sideshow, truth of the matter. Mm. Uh, it, it's been an abuse of democracy on all sides. Um, should we stay? Should we go? Well, well you know, I, I make my feelings clear. Uh, I'm not a European. No, no, don't, don't ask yourself your own questions. Just answer my, <laughs> stick to answering well, mine. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be here all day. Absolutely. Uh, Gavin Fraser, let me, put, Tony says if it's Labour, he doesn't know. Let me suggest one course of action that could take place if it's Labour. If Labour forms a minority government, perhaps with SNP support, perhaps Lib Dem support, we don't know. SNP support may be enough uh, to do it. They would attempt to renegotiate. Uh, they may not get very far, 
They would then call a second referendum in which most of the Labour Party would probably campaign to remain. <coughs> For that second referendum, the franchise could be changed uh, with a, a Labour SNP Lib Dem parliament so that 16-year-olds would get the vote and EU nationals would get the vote too. In these circumstances, the country could vote to remain. So Labour equals remain. Um, yeah, I think we've been on a three-year journey of parliament in particular trying to reverse the vote that occurred in 2016. And I think if you end up with Labour trying to pull together <coughs> a, a, a working majority across a few parties, firstly, it's going to take bloody ages mm -hmm. because if you think the Tories have got no friends, I think it's highly likely neither has Jeremy Corbyn outside of his own party. So we, we saw well, some... The Scottish National Party may beg to differ if, they, if he promises them a second Scottish referendum they may well, given that they want to stop Brexit, they could well support a Corbyn government. I don't mean in coalition, not even perhaps in supply and maintenance, but the SNP could say, if you give us a second referendum <coughs> on independence, we will, give, we will support your minority government in getting a second referendum on Brexit. Yeah, and I think that's quite likely, actually. If, if the Scottish... If the SNP continue to hold as much court as they do now through the next election, which I think is probably likely, mm. um, then they're going to be they're, they're going to have a big chip to bargain with when it comes to, to, to that at the end. Now, the, sorry. The biggest concern for me, though, Andrew, is that this thing just drags on again and again and again. It's paralysing the country at the moment. Yeah. The government's doing nothing else but Brexit, um, and foreign investment is stymied in a big way. And it's which is we're going to come on to mm -hmm. in a minute. Let me come back, though, because even if it's a majority conservative government and we leave by the end of January, uh, we leave legally, but of course, in practice, we don't leave. We move into a transition period. So Brexit doesn't go away in Duncan Smith. Indeed, some of the most <coughs> important issues, our future relationship <coughs> with the EU, remain to be determined. Now, with the original Brexit agreement, there was meant to be a two-year transition period, 20... 20 months, I think, was the timetable. But because of the delay, even if we leave at the end of January, it's only 11 months. Can it really be done in 11 months? Well, it's going to be really, really tough. I don't think we should be in any doubt about that. I mean, the EU, uh, I was talking to the Japanese ambassador actually the other day about their deal. And uh, behind closed doors, he was pretty caustic about the behavior of the EU in negotiation. He said, uh, and the WTO is the same. Uh, they're all a bit angry and fed up with them because they're bullying everybody to start using their law to make sure that the EU's laws are higher than anybody else's. So there are some big challenges ahead. But th the most important thing is when we pass this bill, this act, and it's all ratified, the UK officially becomes sovereign again. In other words, yes, we will then go along with their, their existing regulations for the period, but we are finally sovereign in the sense that we have left, even though we comply with their stuff for the period of time. <coughs> that gives us a different position at the WTO, and it gives us some leverage. But the important thing is we're going to have to be prepared, I think, ultimately, to say we're not extending this. We have to reach some kind of free trade arrangement by that period, or we'll do it from the outside of the EU and complete those negotiations. And that is the way to do it, in truth. The EU needs that deal because they are net, net exporters to us by a vast degree in goods. You know, the car industry in Germany alone, I think it's about a million uh, people are locked into what happens to the UK as an, as an importer. And I think, we're, A, they're the biggest import market, but we're also the fifth largest exporting market in the world. We always talk about something sort of small. We're not small. We're actually a very significant player on the global stage. So, so driving our advantage is going to be really, really important. But the one thing I would say, up until now, the governments and under Theresa May have gone along with civil servants running negotiations. This time, that has to stop. What we have to do, like we did with the privatizations, is bring in the very best lawyers, because the first thing that has to be settled is sovereignty in the first few months. You set the boundaries of sovereignty, then you do trade, not the other way around. Because unless you set the boundaries of sovereignty, they'll run all over us on the trade stuff. And that's I really... Thought, I thought you said we became sovereign when we left at the end of January. No, in, within the trade setup, you have to set the boundaries of who adjudicates what. 
in any future trade deal before you discuss, decide any regulations and tariffs, etc. That's the critical bit which went missing early on, which is why we got in such a mess in the first place. And you can only find that expertise outside of the civil service in people whose job is actually to get this right okay. rather than actually working in the civil service. David Smith, 11 months, is that realistic? Uh, no, it's not. And, uh, and just, just to um, complicate the discussion we're having on the election, I mean, there is the possibility, Andrew, as you, as you will know, of a, what you might call a proper, properly hung parliament in which, say, the Tories got 300 seats, Labour 230, um, mm. and can't form a government, and nobody is, is able to form a government, which, which would be the worst possible outcome. Mm. I think what we'll see on, uh, on the free trade agreement is that um, uh, we have to decide by uh, the end of June whether we want mm. a further extension uh, until the end of 2022. I think that is highly likely that we will extend further into transition because um, one thing we've seen from uh, the Johnson government is an aversion to a no-deal Brexit, I think. I think there was a lot of talk about no deal, but uh, I, I don't think they would want to leave at the end of 2020, despite uh, Ian's arguments, with, without a deal. And this is the bit that um, you know, Sir Ivan Rogers, our former ambassador to the EU, described the divorce as the easy bit. The really challenging bit is the, uh, is the new trade agreement, as, as Ian has mentioned. And these things do take time. Uh, the Canada deal took, uh, took many years. Many people in the Tory party would like something like the Canada deal, uh, but uh, it won't be that easy. These are complicated things to negotiate. Trade agreements, trade negotiations are interminable. Uh, whether the EU is involved, whether anybody else is involved, 11 months is certainly not enough, and I think it will be recognized by uh, the middle of June, uh, by the end of June rather, that that is not long enough and that longer is needed to, uh, to negotiate. Ian Duncan Smith, it's this time next year. The negotiations with the EU have been going well. We can see the shape of a free trade agreement, but we're not there yet. It'll take another four months. Are you seriously saying the government would walk away for the sake of a couple of months? Well, hypotheticals are very difficult to answer in this regard because you'd have to know... It's that, quite a simple hypothetical. Well, the reason why is because you'd have to know specifically that that is a real deadline that would be achieved. Uh, I think it's more likely to be that the government and the EU... First of all, I, I think we, we say the Canada. The reality you've got to understand is that we start the trade deal in a very different position to trade discussions from Canada or Japan. We start on the basis of alignment on regulations and already at zero tariffs. So all of these things are the things that the others had to get to. We've already started there. So our, our challenge is that was the point I was making about sovereign decision-making on the things that go forward in the future. So I think it's not as complex as a Canada deal or a Japan deal. But there is another way, of course, which is that you arrive at the period and then you make a decision. And the decision is if we've only got three or four months, well, you might say, well, we'll finish it off in that. But... You don't know that for certain. So what you might argue then, quite legitimately, is, well, what I'll tell you we'll do is we will go to a basic free trade deal, which is very simple. You start by saying it's continuation of zero tariffs uh, completely, uh, and with regards to regulations, uh, we will accept in our own right that we will do this, but all adjudication takes place in the UK, and now we will complete the deal from the outside in the next, say, seven, eight, or nine months, if it's not two or three months. So there are other options that exist within the WTO. The WTO will allow that because that's exactly right. It doesn't take a huge amount of documentation. It's a three-page uh, document that goes forward, agreeing both sides that you're not going to be raising tariffs and that you will continue at zero tariff levels. So you can make progress even if you then don't agree uh, to extend. You then can finish it off. My point is there has to be progress. And if there is no progress and the EU plays games, you have to have the ability to say, well, we're stepping away. And it's up to you what you want to do, but we're not prepared to let this drag out any longer. What's the big thing for the EU? The EU doesn't get their money if we don't get a deal. And that's where you're going to end up next year. They have a budget deficit of 11 billion at the moment and a hole to fill. And the money that the UK has promised them is money now in the next FTA, which the government can actually say, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to risk that money for you unless we get to the point of where we're meant to be. There has to be something in it as an edge for them. And I would negotiate on that basis. Yeah. Gavin Fraser, you talked about the 
deadening effect of the Brexit uncertainty on investment? Tell us more. Yeah, so it, I mean, if you, if you start by taking the view that property in the UK is largely run by domestic policy, any major change in domestic policy creates a hiccup in the property world. So you would think that the logic would follow that Brexit is kind of a sideshow to property. Mm. It, it, it's not. Um, there's a fair chunk of property, and particularly property development in this country, that, that is fed and funded by foreign capital. And the flow of capital in and out of this country is fundamental to getting the supply-demand dynamic right. And I can show you some serious slowdown in Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool, areas where capital growth has slowed, um, and capital growth has slowed because product isn't coming forward, um, and people aren't prepared to invest ahead and start producing buildings without that, with that, cap, with that sales uncertainty. So this is overseas money which has come in to help the regeneration and new property yeah. in the northern cities, but you think because of Brexit has slowed down? It has definitely slowed down. I, I mean, a, a simple calculation uh, by a five-year-old would tell you that if you've lost 2,000 apartments worth of investment and you've lost half a billion quids worth of investment in six months, and, and if it was resolved one way or the other, either Conservative government we leave, Labour government we likely to stay, either way, does that resolve the issue? It, whichever route resolves the issue quickly, whichever, whichever way you land, we do more damage to our country right now in making no decision than just making a decision and getting on with it. You know, we talked about £11 billion going to the EU. One city in this country has lost half a billion quid already. In what of way? Just, just lack of investment. Lack of investment. It's stymie the flow of investment. And what happens is you don't just immediately get that back either. We might do as a good look um, point because the pound is low. And if it gets lower, then we will get an influx of capital. But, but it's caused serious underinvestment. Tony Gimbel. Well, on that area of you know, underinvestment and money's coming in. It may have started with Brexit, but now the fear for overseas investors is not whether we stay or whether we go, it's whether if we don't get an overall Tory majority, we end up with a potentially far left Marxist government and no overseas investor in their right mind would suddenly <coughs> throw billions at the UK only to find that you've got compulsory sale, compulsory pu purchase, the state squeezing developers, uh, private landlords out simply because of a political dogma. That's where the real fear is. I think, just to add, uh, to compliment uh, my friend on my left here, uh, the big risk is that our own pension companies start to invest in different domains yes. because they don't like the regulatory environment we might land. You mean they begin to invest overseas? Yeah, well, they do that already. They spread bet on that. But do you agree with Tony of, uh, of I mean, he's essentially saying, I think, that the prospect of a Corbyn government is a bigger threat to these investment flows than Brexit uncertainty. Yeah, I'll, I'll, t I'll give you one example. We've done a 100 million quid deal for a 500-unit block of flats with Invesco. Invesco are a worldwide powerhouse in terms of managing other people's money. All of the money in investment funds in the UK for built-to-rent come from local authority pension yeah. funds but they can be invested anywhere in EMEA, in, in Europe in particular. If, if it becomes too difficult to invest in this country because of the political environment we're in and that we just don't trust our own governance anymore, then they'll stop investing here. Your pensions will be invested in other countries because it's safer, you know? Okay. David Smith, is the, uh, is the property business right to be so concerned about the prospect of a Corbyn government? Yeah, I think we're, uh, we're in danger of agreeing violently on this one because the, uh, you know, the, um, the, there is no better way of um, putting up a, a no-entry sign for foreign investment in Britain than uh, the election of a Corbyn government. I mean, we're talking about uh, nationalisation, without full compensation, we're talking about a much different and uh, more interventionist regulatory regime. We're talking about restoring the, um, the power of the unions, the power and the influence of the unions to uh, the pre-Thatcher days. 
And, you know, for landlords, uh, there is this talk of, you know, compulsory right to buy at a discount for, um, uh, for, for private sector tenants, uh, which is another form of expropriation. So I think uh, you combine those things. And I know, you know, quite recently, one of the, one of the investment banks talked about um, a Corbyn government with Remain being better for uh, markets than a, a no-deal Brexit. But I think that was, was naive, and I think that is fa a fantasy that, um, if you, as I say, if you want to deter foreign investment in Britain, you elect a Corbyn government. It's as, it's yeah. as simple as that. Yeah. But most <coughs> observers I speak to think that an overall Labour majority government is highly unlikely, but that a minority Labour government, some kind of arrangement with some of the other parties, is possible. Uh, a minority Labour government, it wouldn't be able to do all that, would it? It would be, uh, I mean, if you had a minority Labour government in some kind of partnership with the SNP, um, I think the SNP would be, um, would be happy with the promise of a, uh, another Scottish referendum mm. and would not deter most of the domestic policy which they would see as applying to mm -hmm. England for, uh, of a Labour government. So, uh, so there might be... So there wouldn't be a break, you say? I don't think there would be a huge break. And, uh, and I, I think the, you know, the difference between um, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell and most opposition uh, leadership teams is that you know, most oppositions, when they get into government, are more moderate than, uh, than they've, uh, they've uh, suggested in opposition. I think they would be more extreme than they've suggested in opposition. Oh. So, so, so uh, you're right, there could be constraints, there could be checks and balances, but um, once they get a hold of, the, of power, I think they, uh, they would at least try a, a socialist, a Marxist experiment in, yeah. in Britain. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm happy to take some questions on this. I see a gentleman there with his hand up, if we can go right back up there. And let me see another hand, and there's a gentleman there too. We get a second mic to him. No, let's go up to the top and then get the second mic to the gentleman there. Keep your hand up so we know. Hmm. Yes, sir. Doesn't the risk of a hung parliament just make the decision to call an election worse? If we've had all agree that we've had three years of stagnation since the Brexit vote, why are we opening up to an election now which could give us another four years or worse of Corbyn government? Ian Duncan Smith, if uh, yeah. your leader doesn't get an overall majority, we end up with a hung parliament. Um, he's made a huge strategic error. Well, all elections at the end of the day are a chance. In other words, you have to expect that you can make a better pitch to the others. I think the biggest point answer to the question, though, is we have exactly that right now, and we're going nowhere. Uh, and the reality is the prospect is to go nowhere at all over the next few months. Uh, the Labour Party is absolutely adamant. Uh, the leadership, not the rest of the party, but the leadership is adamant that they're not going to let this deal go through one way or the other. So what you'll end up is just more prevarication and delay anyway had we not gone for the election. Uh, and the indecision that uh, uh, everybody here has been talking about, which I think is in terms of investment, in terms of the future of the UK, very, very debilitating, that would just carry on. So I think the choice was very stark for him. You know, we, we wanted to get this settled and then have an election, <coughs> but we can't get it through. We need to have an election. The British, I think the real point is not about politicians. The question now is for the public. What do you want? Do, you know, you have to make a choice. In 2017, the public were just fed up, all of you and, uh, and beyond, didn't want the election. It was too soon, I agree, after the referendum. Uh, we had a majority. We should have got on with it and sorted it out. 2017 election is the reason we are in this mess now. But I think now they know more about Mr. Corbyn. They know more about this government. And I think they have to make a decision about whether they want this stasis, a Corbyn government, or they want to have a Conservative government now that says, right, we're going to deliver Brexit and we're going to get on. And the point I would make, actually, which David made earlier on, which backs up this point and I'll finish, it's that uh, I don't think the Nationalists do want to form any check on Jeremy Corbyn. Because if you look at what they've been pursuing in Scotland, 
with very high taxes now and some really, I think, my personal view, catastrophic decisions in Scotland education, but very high spending levels. There's no reason why they wouldn't go along with a Corbyn government because it gives them cover to do quite similar things up in Scotland as well. We're not talking about a liberal kind of free market organization in the, nation, in the, in the Scottish nationalists. They are pretty close to where Corbyn is by and large on most of their policies. So I think the choice, this, is, this choice, this election is more stark than at any time in my political life. I think the issues are bigger more important and bolder than have ever been on an election since I've been around, arguably since the early days of Thatcher. I think this is as big an election, and people can't you, say... You've been around since before the early days of Thatcher. <laughs> I wasn't. Long before. Excuse me a second. <laughs> Hang on a second. I, I only got elected in 92, so I, I missed Yeah, it. but you did have a life before you became a politician. Well, I did. It was a great I mean, life. is it actually. a bigger <laughs> job? <laughs> well, what the hell I did since then. Yeah. But the, when, um, when Ted Heath... Ask the country in 1974, who governs the country, the government or the trade unions? That was a huge choice for the nation, it, which it bottled, it, but it was a huge choice. Yeah. yeah, but I think that, you know, you go back to the early 1980s when you face this issue about which way does the country go, and Thatcher, <coughs> some may not like her, others may, but the reality, she made some big choices, and the destiny of the country, they came different. I think we're at that stage now. I generally okay, <laughs> let me go to the gentleman here with the mic. Yeah, the two previous prime ministers, that, uh, they ignored the UKIP and Brexit party at their peril. To have the, uh, do you think Boris Johnson is going to have the same fate if he does not open dialogue with the Brexit party? Which he says he's not doing. Is that sensible? Indeed. Who else would one ask on this panel <laughs> but a man born in 1992? <laughs> yeah, I'm younger than I look. Um, <laughs> can I just say that I think, first of all, um, I want to park UKIP on one side for a second because UKIP in the, in the 2015 election lost huge ground because we promised the referendum, got the referendum, and that, I think, delivered on what they had asked for. The referendum party has been created as a reaction to not leaving on March the 29th. Uh, do we have to do deals with Nigel Farage? I don't think it's feasible to do any kind of electoral pacts uh, with the referendum party. I generally don't. I think on this, Boris Johnson is right, and there's a reason for that. I think the Conservative Party is very different. It's not a single-issue party. You know, we are a party that's going to have to form a government that does everything from health right the way through to Brexit. Yes, Brexit's a core element of what we do. But I think the stark choice that faces the public today is not going to be dealt with by a Brexit party. It, it, the only party that can deliver a Brexit is a Conservative party. It's as simple as that. If you don't want Brexit, then you will go and vote for somebody else. But if you want to get this done, there is only one party after this that will actually be able to deliver it, and that is the Conservative Party. That choice, I think, is pretty clear. And I think <coughs> Mr. Farage has to face a choice. Does he want to win an argument or win Brexit? Because he can't have both. If he wants to win an argument, then he's going to carry on and debilitating and having a go at Conservatives and others, etc. Or he can decide that actually it's time to get with the Conservative Party and get this done, because it's the only party that's going to get it done Otherwise, we're going to end up either with a Labour government, uh, which doesn't want to leave, or a coalition that doesn't want to leave, or a mess where we have more of the same, which the gentleman up there was asking about earlier on. Yeah. David Smith, has, uh, since Boris Johnson became Conservative leader, the Brexit Party's share of the vote in polls has gone down because he, Mr. Johnson, has tried to reposition the Conservative Party as the Brexit Party, mm. in effect. Has he done enough of that to, to, to sideline the Brexit party. They'll still get some votes, but has he done enough to sideline the Brexit party so that it doesn't stop him getting an overall majority? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, this is, this is, um, this is the question I posed, whether, whether the Brexit party takes, uh, is more of an inconvenience to the Tories than to Labour. But I think in, in answer to your question, um, I mean, Nigel Farage made, it, made an offer to Boris Johnson that um, it was impossible for yeah. him to accept. I mean, he was, he was never going to abandon his deal as part of a, an agreement with the Brexit Party. But I think where the Brexit Party has a point, and uh, Ian will disagree with this, is that the, um, the Johnson withdrawal agreement 
is not a great deal. I mean, you know, we, we know perfectly well why the uh, Democratic Unionists oppose it so strongly. In fact, for them, I think Theresa May's deal was, was a better arrangement. So what we've got is a very messy and convoluted customs arrangement for Northern Ireland. We've got uh, the backstop's gone, but it's been replaced by a front stop. In other words, permanent arrangements from day one for Northern Ireland and the, uh, the border. And I think the, you know, the more that the Brexit party can, uh, can focus on that and the fact that it's not, it's, it's not a terribly good deal, the fact that the European research group of, of Tory MPs having said that they would do whatever the DUP did, abandon the DUP, looks, looks quite bad from a, a conservative point of view. So I think there is, a, there is an attack there. And I, I, I certainly think um, Boris Johnson and his colleagues, including Ian, shouldn't ignore the Brexit party. I think they've got, to, they've got to fight them on why this deal is a compromise. It's maybe not the best compromise ever, but it's, it's perhaps the only one we can have. You know? so, but it's, you know, there is a line of attack there for the Brexit party, which can't be ignored. And we shall see how many candidates they put up in there, yeah. too, because that's still to be unresolved. Gavin, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I, I, I just think there's a bit that we probably miss in the analysis on this. Um, I, I think the Tory party have positioned themselves as a Brexit party, and they're making a succinct message this early in the process that Brexit will get done very quickly if they get in. So I think the, the Tory voters that would be leaning to the Brexit party probably don't have a, a reasonably good reason for doing it. The Labour voters, though, on the other hand, are, are in, in an awkward position because there's a fair chunk of Labour voters who are Brexit voters. <coughs> They're mostly from the north and it mostly centres around the immigration point. So what Corbyn has done is come up with this, in my view, half assed idea that he's going to have a customs union because everybody wants to be in the single market, but he's going to come out of all the other arrangements and, 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 and effectively halt the immigration stuff. And I would take it to Burnley or Sunderland and just have a look at how the first-past-the-post system there would work. The key thing there in the relationship between the Brexit party slash UKIP and the other main parties is how Labour deal with that, because they don't have an answer at the moment. And it, I, I don't think you'll see a big shift of people leaving the Tory party and voting Brexit. But there's no, the Labour haven't come up with a cunning enough plan to keep the people on their side who would have left and voted Brexit as a protest to get the thing done. But they are also the voters who, because of generational uh, arrangements, probably will never vote Conservative. Well, that's no. the issue. And I want to get some more questions in, and I'm going to move forward to uh, some issues specifically that affect uh, the property market. But th this is the issue. It, it's clear the Conservatives in the South will lose some votes to the Lib Dems. Uh, some Remain votes will go to the Lib Dems. It's clear that they'll lose some votes to the SNP in Scotland. Uh, maybe not as much as people think, but they'll lose uh, some uh, on that too. To compensate for that, and I can see that costing the Tories 20 to 25 seats overall, to compensate for that, they need to win in the Midlands, in the North, and in Wales. Yeah. Areas that have not been traditionally very pro-conservative. Now, is Brexit the issue big enough to make traditional Labour voters vote conservative in this election? You're from the North East, I take it? it, it and I'm probably the right generation to answer that, having... Good. You know, Thatcher still living long in the memory and weighing lace to big chunks of the north, let's be honest. I know she did some fabulous other things and I wouldn't put her down for that. Um, but that's becoming a bit, little long in the memory now. And also, the parties that we recognise today are not the same parties, oh. you know. And, and, but Labour has lost its strength in the north. It was a highly unionised suite of industries in the north 30 years ago and the unions drove the affiliation of the Labour Party, it's gone. There's also a lot of Labour voters in the North increasingly see Mr Corbyn's Labour Party as a, as a very London-centric, yeah. mm. uh, metropolitan yeah. party, which is much more middle class than yeah. the Northern Labour voter. Is it, would that be fair? Yeah, and, and to constantly focus on the railways, because it's, it's very London-centric, 
mm. is because they are obsessed with London. I don't think they look at the North in the same way as they used to. Tony? Okay, so if we look at constituencies where there's a sitting Labour MP, where the majority came from people who wanted to leave, <coughs> and the whip says, you have to vote with a Labour government who wants to stay, that's where the danger is. Yeah. And, and that's where I think, just, not just in the North, but everywhere, where the electorate feels most let down and abused. But the problem, will, the, the choice they will have, if, if they feel that strongly about it, is to end their lifelong Labour voting habit. Mm. But do they vote Conservative or do they vote Brexit? That's the harder decision. Um, That's but, why I asked it. But Brexit is only, <laughs> you know, the Brexit party is a one-trick pony. But for these people to leave the Labour Party voting, maybe that's the only trick that really matters in this election too. But is it the Labour Party anymore? <coughs> I don't think it is. Uh, Ian? I, we're obviously going to be in danger of disappearing into this vortex, but there is a point that's worth remembering. Back in 2017, if you look at the results of the 2017 election, had uh, the uh, result been a half point difference, mm -hmm. there would have been a cascade of Labour seats up north that would have gone to the Conservatives. Because they were held on to them by only a couple of hundred I votes. Mean, Bishop Auckland is a very good mm. example. Which used to held, be solid as a rock. You know, used to weigh the vote. They didn't bother to count it there. They just stuck <laughs> it on a set of scales. And, uh, you know, the Conservative one just went through the roof up and the Labour one went down. It's 300 or thereabouts is the majority to Labour over a Conservative. Grabs or ounces. So my point really is in South Wales and the Valleys, I was talking to a couple of Labour members, good friends of mine, and they said that the Labour uh, organisation is disintegrating in these areas at the moment because it's very leave in that area and they're very unhappy with the Labour position. So I'm not making any predictions, I'm simply saying, that's why I said earlier, this election is all those original tectonic plates of loyalty and affiliation are breaking down. Is Labour did well down in the southeast mm. at the last election in 2017. Mm. They didn't do well up north. We did better up north, mm. didn't do so well down where we normally do incredibly well. So that set of plates is really going to be difficult to call. But I do think uh, people are beginning to talk about their affiliations in a way they haven't done in, in my political lifetime. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can see the world, the strange world we're moving into when a conservative is talking about the Welsh valleys. <laughs> Positive. Let's get some questions, some more. There's a gentleman there, and then we'll get the mic down to, to you. But let me see another one from uh, over in this side of the hall. Questions? Questions? Yes, gentleman, the blue shirt there will come to you as well. Keep your hand up so we can get the mic. Yes, sir, who's got the mic? Yes. Uh, oh. uh, gentlemen, we've had a very interesting. Uh, 40, 50, 60 percent of our time together talking politics and with respect we can get that anywhere question time all the illustrious shows we're all here we're all here because we're all interested in how it will impact the UK property market I don't care which model you think is going to come out in six weeks time but could you tell us please as national landlord investors what do you think the impact is going to be on our market. Our but you, you can't decide the impact until you tell us what you think the outcome will be. The impact of a Corbyn government on your business will be dramatically different. So, Absolutely. Uh, from, so which scenario would you like us to discuss? I, I don't, whichever you think is most likely, but could we discuss one of them rather than doing just politics? Well, what do you think? Well, we've not just done politics. We've actually been talking about the investment situation in property uh, and, and so on. I so, never thought I was going to so get into a slangy match. Tell with us what Neal. scenario you would like us to discuss. Well, I think it's most likely we're probably going to end up with a hung parliament in some form. Uh, but, but actually, I'm not a political expert. You gentlemen are. You've given us a, a praise of what well, you you may be more there. of a political expert after listening to this discussion. <laughs> 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 but I want to know how it impacts the market. The, pr the problem, even in that scenario, Tony, is that a hung parliament who's in power. Now, I have argued this morning for discussion that a, a hung parliament essentially means a Labour government yeah. because the Tories have no allies now with which to form it. So you would have, a, that's essentially a Labour government scenario, a hung parliament, okay. which uh, you've probably learned something already you didn't know. So <laughs> uh, that would mean a Corbyn government, 
Well, it could be unstable. Yeah. Uh, we don't know how long it would last. Yeah. It may only get the support of the SNP or other parties for the duration of the Brexit project. Yeah. But what would it mean for the property business? Disaster. Utter disaster. Why don't you get off the fence? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, there, I'm, I'm off the fence. Why would it be a disaster? Fine, okay. So, um, hard left governments are notoriously anti uh, the private sector and landlords in particular. Um, I, I think it, Corbyn, t Corbyn tends to categorise every private landlord as a rogue landlord. Are there any rogue landlords in this audience? Thank you. Right. Well, they're hardly going to admit it, are they? I'm a rogue landlord. Oh, <coughs> uh, yeah. Call the police now. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. No. Um, any left-wing government, such as Corbyn, with an outright majority or not, would be absolute disaster for the private rented sector, who now account for a huge amount of social housing. Mm -hmm. you know, compulsory purchase, uncertain values, the, the economy would tank even for a short while. If, however, we do get a, a, a working Tory majority, whether we stay in the EU or not, frankly, it, 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 it's gone beyond that, then what that Tory majority would have to do is start treating the sector as proper businesses and not just old-fashioned Victorian uh, investment businesses. At that point, the sector could grow. Work, work in conjunction with local authorities and form a new way forward to solve a lot of the ills that are property and poverty based by restoring the social uh, contract with those who can't help themselves and not won't help themselves. All right, I'm going to come to the question up there in a minute. Before I do, Gavin, is it your view that in terms of the UK property market and particularly uh, residential landlords, is, is the outcome of the election much more important than whether or not Brexit happens? Mm. Yeah, the outcome of the election is the decision on whether Brexit happens. It, it is. It, it simply is. It, if, if, if we end up in a scenario where we've got a Labour leadership that has to pander to another party, let's be honest, that's how coalitions have to work, Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to get indecision. There's going to be a period where we just get nothing done. Um, and investment, again, will slow. And, and so it comes back to your investment point again. You know, it, it's, it's absolutely critical. We have a housing crisis in this country and nobody is doing anything about it. There is a wall of capital that will resolve that stuff. There are investors in the room here who want to invest in more product. We need to bring more stuff forward. We don't need to stop it. The reason why house prices are so high is we're not building anywhere near enough stuff. So to just continue to make the whole thing about Brexit and the whole thing of, around how you get control of Parliament, which has become utterly dysfunctional, mm -hmm. it, you know, it needs resolving. It needs resolving quickly. The alternative is desperately worrying. But Tony's point <laughs> was if, you, if it's resolved that Brexit doesn't happen and there's a Labour government, a Corbyn government, that would still, your investment still won't come in. That's his point. It, Do you agree? If, if there's a Corbyn government, it's going to be more difficult. I, I cannot tell you exactly what will happen. It will come down to the individual discretions of individual fund managers. And it will come down to the individual decision making in this room. Who here, I, I know I'm going to come to you, who here is holding off making investment decisions until they have a better idea of the political land, both in interesting, lots of hands going up, both in terms of Brexit and the general election. Keep your hands up, I just want to see. That's a lot of people yeah. mm -hmm. are holding off to see. Let me go to the gentleman who's got the microphone up there. Hello. Yeah, yeah. I, I live in London, but I'm originally from Scotland. Uh, so I'm very curious to know what the Conservative strategy is to retain the seats they had in Scotland <coughs> and to fill the void that's been left with Ruth Davidson vacating the party. Ian Duncan Smith. Could you, could you just stick your hand up? Because I couldn't see where you were. Oh, there. Right, sorry. Um, I think the, the election in Scotland is going to be a different election in many senses from the election uh, in England and Wales and even Northern Ireland. But the key bit here is in Scotland, of course, the main argument is about the Scottish nationalist determination to have 
another referendum uh, so that they can leave the Union uh, of the United Kingdom. I think that's going to be the predominant campaign issue. It was in 2017, by the way, and the Conservatives massively increased their, their, <coughs> their representation. Uh, so although people talk about this in complex terms, I think in Scotland you're going to see a head-to-head -head about whether there should be another referendum. What's happened that makes that quite interesting is that the Labour Party now, much to the fury of Scottish Labour, by the way, have now indicated that they would be prepared to consider another referendum in Scotland. And I think that means immediately now that if you are a pro-unionist, in other words, you want to stay part of the United Kingdom, it's beginning to be clear you've probably only got one place to go, which is to support the Conservatives in this election, because otherwise Labour might give them a referendum and you don't think the Liberals will make it into government, so you're left with one choice. And Ruth Davidson will come back into this election campaign again, and she's a very big asset. She's similar in one sense to Boris Johnson in her campaigning skills. So I'm, I, I, I'm not sure where that election is going to go, because I think the stark choice is a different choice but it's a very emotive choice up in Scotland, and I think you're going to see some real shifting around there. So, so I mean, Andrew said earlier on he, he didn't think you'd lose as many seats. I, I actually am not even certain that we won't be gaining some seats in Scotland. I think it's, a, it's all to play for in Scotland in a way that is, again, different, as it is different in England, but different for a different reason. So uh, the strategy there will be, if you want to stay in the Union of the United Kingdom, then you've got to vote Conservative because they're the only ones that will guarantee that we are not having that second referendum. And I was fascinated, by the way, uh, by the leader of the Scottish Nationalists, uh, the First Minister, um, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, and she said when asked on television the other day, so wait a minute, what if they do vote to leave the union? Uh, would you uh, put your deal to them for a second referendum? She said no. So she's arguing for a second referendum on Brexit but she's damned if she's going to give the Scottish people a second referendum if they somehow choose to go, and then she has a deal. So you can see hypocrisy is running right the way through all of our arguments. Yeah. Hypocrisy from a politician. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> um, <laughs> let me uh, come back. The, the, the panel seems to be pretty unanimous in thinking that a Corbyn government would be bad news for landlords. That seems to be your view. But supposing the Conservatives do win an overall majority, we've got another five years of Tory rule. Already under the Conservatives, we've had a ban on tenant fees. We've had a cap on deposits. Uh, the government's been looking at three-year tenancy uh, terms. And we've had the stamp duty levy of 3% on landlords. What else have you got in store for them? <laughs> All right, I know. <laughs> <coughs> I personally think we've pretty much gone too far. My biggest argument over... Oh, you would say that to this audience. <laughs> <three. I> mean, <laughs> hang on. I have been saying it in the other three opinions <laughs> I've made here. Uh, uh, I think the biggest issue for many landlords is now this scale of regulation now. It's pouring down onto private landlords. The second thing is I don't think that by squeezing the buy-to-let market you actually really increase the number of houses directly that are available. To George Osborne did. Mm. And I think he was wrong. That's my personal view. I think he was wrong on that. I think now what we want to do, and I'm certainly campaigning for that, is, yeah, okay, well, we, we recognize there are some problems for tenants, and some have been abused. Most landlords don't, by the way, but there are some abusive areas. And in squeezing that, we've also got to have another let out. So uh, I think there are proposals in the wind at the moment to come make next year a much easier, much swifter process of evicting tenants uh, than you have at the moment. And that's one of the promises the government has made that they've already started on. I'm very much in favor of that because that's one of the big issues. You, time after time, landlords say, you know, you get somebody who never pays their rent, they leave their house in a terrible condition, you just can't get rid of them. So we have to find a much swifter way through the courts to get them out when that's the case, and there's good evidence for that. The second thing is I do think we need to look at the regulation. The truth is the problem has been that local authorities don't prosecute uh, bad landlords who are clearly bad and what we've done is we think well we need more regulation to stop bad landlords. Bad landlords are bad landlords mm -hmm. and they should be prosecuted and driven out of the market because what they've done is by not prosecuting them government has fallen back on over regulating what essentially is a decent market made up by decent people and so there we have to change it.
Gavin, what would you expect, or what should we expect from, in this scenario we're talking about, a majority Conservative government, as far as landlords are concerned? Well, uh, firstly, I'm in violent agreement with Ian. By the way, if we're going to get into violence, I'm going to get the first punch in on this. Bob Wayne. <laughs> you do realise I was born seven miles outside of Glasgow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you live in France now, so... You know. Carry on. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think there's some things though that needs finishing. I, it, I, I'll give you for instance, we, we talked about, we've gone too far in regulating the landlords. We've also started things and not finished them, which has caused a massive erosion of value. Give me some examples. The freehold reversion, the ground rent review that occurred. We had a big consultation, everybody got into a big fight about it and Everybody come away with a few scars, and then there was a decision that we were going to do something about it. That decision was vocalised in a letter from Sajid Javed two Christmases ago. And not that was when he was housing. Yeah, yes. not, and, and obviously he's moved on to different things and this, that, and the other, but nothing has happened with it. What, what that translates to in practice, um, it creates a small erosion of value on high value assets. So the tower blocks that you saw before we come in here, before, where you're selling stuff at 500 quid a foot. Losing the value of the freehold is nothing in that. But what, what it does is the areas where you guys would, would pr probably love to play, the lower value areas, the high yielding areas, it brings viability to its knees. So I had a scheme in Warrington that I've sold to a, a, a German pension company for 363 units. I would dearly have loved to have done another 500 units there. In and this areas is where because of government inactivity, well, it, government failing to see something through. Correct. So, so the, the, there's an element of the valuation comes from the valuation of the freehold. Now, there's a load of rogue behaviour from freeholders out there. So instead of just dealing with it and legislating for the, the, the tossers and the process, they killed everything. Tossers just, being a technical term. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We use it a lot in Newcastle, you know. It's, uh, 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 Tony, what, what reason is there to believe... Uh, we know what you think about a Corbyn government. That's, that's your view. That's fine. But what reason is it to believe that a Conservative government would be the landlord's friend? Good question. I think you just answered it over there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the point, the, the point that Gavin made is, is spot on. Yeah. <coughs> There's no point in having any form of regulation, whether it's outcomes-based or today, unless you have enforcement. <coughs> that is the key. If you're introducing any form of regulation, then you must have the means with which to enforce it on the ground at the time. Otherwise, it's just ignored. That's the problem. I agree. And what's the answer to my question? Being? <laughs> what reasons do you have to believe that a Conservative government would be the landlord's friend? Do they want our votes or not? Do they want to be able to us to contribute to, to the economy? That is a very good reason to be the landlord's friend. Yeah, but they wanted your votes in 2010, and many of you may have voted in 2010 for them, and you then had Mr. Osborne as Chancellor, and the end of the attempt to undermine right to buy, the stamp duty uh, um, penalty, the inability to deduct interest rate. I do not need to go on. You know more than I do about this. So let me ask again, what okay. bit of you makes you think the Tories are a landlord's friend? Hobson's choice, I suppose. Yeah, the, the, Hobson's the, not the Chancellor. <laughs> we might get rid of it. I, I, I would say that overall, a free trade Tory party will be better off for the landlord sector and more willing to listen and not go with dogma than any okay. other government. Let's get some questions from the folks. The woman down here, we'll get a microphone to you right away. And also the, the gentleman behind you, I said we'd get to you. So if you pass the mi mic, that, no, you're, no, we'll get... No, okay. hold on, hold on. You can pass that mic past. Uh, there's a gentleman there, and then I want to move up to the back. Give him that mic there. Uh, someone's so upset with your remarks, Tony, he's leaving the hall. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm going to the... Uh, I'll try harder next time. Uh, okay, but basically... He's ju just going to sorry. check his investments. Okay, uh, basically... Yes. Um, Jeremy Corbyn recently called dodgy landlords, and that's who he was going to get rid of. And I heard that on um, a couple of weeks ago. Indeed. So why can't Boris Johnson do something for all of us that will make us vote in the election? And what would you like that to be? 
uh, reversal of uh, any tax. We are the only company in the UK that gets taxed on profit on turnover. rather than on our net income. Mm. So, et cetera, et cetera. There are many, many things that the government could do, mm. including regulation, yes, and including... I would, I would more than be happy to be regulated. I'm more than happy to do that, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm a really good landlady, mm. but I want some recognition mm. from the government as to why I should be at my computer then thinking, oh, it's got dock. You know, I'm working really hard. I, I understand. And in, in nine years of Conservative government, which is what we've had now, do you feel that you've had that recognition? No. Which okay. is why I want that recognition. How and hopeful the are you? thousands of people. How? I, do, I, don't, I don't know because <laughs> I have example well, to follow. But and my I advice would be... not doing anything for me. My advice would be, don't hold your breath. No. <laughs> 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 All right, let's, but I'm going to get some more. Thank you for that. It's very interesting. And we'll see when it comes to the Conservative manifestos, because we've not seen them yet, if there is anything like that that you say. It'll be a very interesting test. I'd like the microphone to go to the gentleman. Are you all right? No. Are you happy? Oh, that's superb. So, so I, I forgot what the question was now. Well, we've, that's exactly what... Oh, yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> I mean, do you want us to try harder? <laughs> I'm glad you're not. On, I'm glad you're not on question time. Right. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, it's all right. The technology will George look after Osborne, itself. George um, Council Tax Relief on Mortgages. Sorry, Mr. First, but George Osborne, Council Tax Relief on Mortgages. That affects this was for buy to let. Yes, exactly. Um, that basically doesn't exactly make it that attractive anymore for people to invest. If people leave the market, there's going to be less houses buy to let. There's a, it's going to push the prices up and it's actually going to have a negative effect, um, you know, if you didn't mm. think it through, basically. So is that going to be reversed? Are you going to review that? You right, it's a good, good question. I would suggest, Ian Duncan Smith, that a future Conservative government is not going to reverse that change. Well, I certainly haven't heard any statements from them at the moment about reversing it, but there are some other things that they can do which helps the market. I think, I think a lot of this problem stemmed from a mis... I think a misunderstanding of the problem, which was based mostly in central London, about people from overseas buying up properties and then not occupying them at all uh, and doing all of that. And I think there was a big, huge row about it. It was all in the papers, and then, you know, the, the stamp duty stuff and everything else seemed to have been changed to reduce that. And to some degree, that's fallen away. I think the problem is that somehow we are juxtaposing the buy-to-let market as being a restriction on the buy-to-own market, uh, particularly for under 35s. Uh, I, I actually don't see it like that, and I think we need to rebalance that. I think we've got it out of balance. We think that driving one down increases the other. While there has been some increase in home ownership, it's, it's marginal, I think. So the key bit comes, A, a commitment to build many more properties, which is critical, actually, in this process. And the second thing is we do, however, have to recognize that now in London, the private rented sector is the bigger sector. It's not the social-owned sector. It's the private rented sector. And so sometimes you just have to recognize you've got to go with the flow. And the flow is that the housing provided for people on low incomes is mostly coming from many of you people here in this hall. So what we've got to figure out is what are the difficulties in that and if it is in any way impacting in different areas the nature of purchase of the housing. And I think we really need to look at this very carefully, and I think we haven't done enough of that. But I do think the points I made earlier on are really important. I think this idea of dodgy landlords is in fact all about criticizing the whole yes. arena. So when Corbyn or anybody else says, oh, I don't like dodgy landlords, what they want you to remember is all landlords are dodgy. So now I have carte blanche to get after the lot of you uh, because I don't really like you. The, the, the anger is in the title, Lord, Landlord. Yeah. In other words, you're some <coughs> profiteering, nasty bunch of people. So the way that I think my government, Conservative government, <coughs> could do is get after the bad landlords, and the councils don't prosecute, and we need to drive okay. prosecution. But the second element we do, we need to look at uh, the buy-to-let market in the terms of its need. 
And I think, therefore, we do have to do something about, A, the nature of the regulation, and B, some of the issues of cost that we've piled on it. Now, I've been arguing that, whether we get something <coughs> in the manifesto or not. I do think, however, that there is a beginnings of a recognition that the idea that if you squeeze this, suddenly you release everybody to buy their homes isn't actually going to happen. All right. Now, let me stop you there, because you've said that uh, quite clearly. We've got 10 minutes, and I want to get lots of questions in. I want to go up to the back now. There's a gentleman there in a gray sweater. Let's get a microphone to him. And let me see. And there's a lady there in a... Oh, you're going to pass the mic to him? Well, you may not get it back. <laughs> and that's quite a sacrifice. Okay, well, you go first, and then we'll go up there, and you're going to have to take your chances. Yes. Yeah, um, sticking strictly to housing matters, um, I, I think, obviously, we've got quite a, uh, a right-leaning panel here, so I want to try and put a, a, a slightly different perspective. Now, as a landlord myself, I don't think that a right to buy for tenants would be a disaster. I think if we had, say, for example, a situation where tenants had to be in good standing for a long period of time, they had to have occupied the house for a long period of time, and the right to buy a discount is very modest, maybe 5%, then that might actually incentivize good tenant behavior um, and, 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 and be transformational for the industry, but, but not crippling for it. And I'd like to, uh, I'm not a Corbynite by any means, but I'd like to see if the panel could envisage uh, an implementation of that key Corbyn policy that the, the, the landlord industry could get behind. And, and it's a policy Mr. Corbyn has been advocating. And you know, when Mrs. Thatcher advocated right to buy for social tenants, it was regarded as a huge success. Why not right to buy in the circumstances the gentleman here suggested? Well, put that way, it's not such a bad idea. My wife and I bought our first property to live in under the right to buy. She, she, she was living in a, in a Guinness Trust housing association type. We couldn't buy that but we still were entitled to a discount to buy a, a, a private property. Now, you're right, ha having good tenants over a long period of time and putting something back into the community so that those who want to move on and buy a modest 5%, maybe a tax break somewhere along the line, could enable that, isn't such a bad idea. You know, it's okay. one nation Tory. There you go. I've made him a socialist. I did not believe that was possible. Oh, can, can, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Right, who's got the microphone over here now? Up there, yes, sir. You, the gentleman there, keep your hand up. Where is the other microphone? Chat with the grey. Has someone else got it? Yeah, what I wanted to ask. Where are you? You're there, right. Now I see you, and then we'll come back to you, all right? Yes, sir. I think the point here that hasn't really been mentioned by anyone is that renting has now become a lifestyle. You're gonna have to speak up. It closes your mouth. Become a lifestyle choice <coughs> for many people. And this hasn't been recognized by the Tories, is that many families, many young people actually want to rent. And the big change in the buy-to-let market is we've had a 20% fall in take-up of new mortgages. If you look at figures from TMW and, and BM Solutions, who are the leading mortgage lenders. You, you need to hold the microphone close. No, the oh, microphone is fine. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, Who would have thought it would work if you just <laughs> held it to your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, as I was saying, it, it's the failure to realize that renting has now become a lifestyle choice yes. for many people, families, young people, right. studying, working, not just in London, but elsewhere. And the big change in the buy-to-let market, as I see it, because I work part-time as a mortgage consultant as well, is we've had a 20% fall in the take-up of new mortgages um, but from the two biggest countries, uh, mortgage lenders, TMW and BM Solutions. So we're actually now seeing a very real contraction in the buy-to-let market. And what will happen inevitably is when the economy gets stronger, the moment it's relatively weak, we will see prices of rents go through the roof because the supply will not be there for new properties. And that will hurt tenants badly. So really, the only way out of this for this Tory government and the Tories in the future is to say we will reverse Section 24 completely to actually boost uh, rental demand and, and get new landlords on board. And Section 24 is to do with... Is the restriction in mortgage interest... Is interest a, deduction. Relief. Yes. Okay. I'm going to take that as a, a really interesting contribution. Can we get the microphone up to the gentleman there? Who's got the microphone? Get, get, let's have the generous lady who... Uh, for swore having it to show that uh, it's not always the case that no good deed goes unpunished, yes. I'm, I'm getting quite upset here this morning because 
Ian Duncan Smith is the personification of hypocrisy as I see it. I've been a landlord for 27 years in London. There's been more regulation introduced in the period of the last, while Tories have been in power since 2010. They've targeted so-called rogue landlords. And Ian Duncan Smith has the nerve to sit here and talk about local authorities not enforcing the regulation. How can they when you've been cutting back on their funding for the last 10 years? You, you also talk about dodgy landlords. Every party has targeted the dodgy landlords and you've been pandering to the electorate, primarily in that case, the young people who can't afford to buy. The likes of the majority of us in the room here probably abide by those regulations. It's those out there who are not here who don't abide by them. And there has been more regulation introduced to the point where I think a lot of us, like myself, are thinking, I've had enough, I'm going to leave. That's going to cause more problems in the long run because you will have a lower level of supply. You know, I, I'm, there's, it's been a one-sided discussion here this morning. N not anymore. Well, it's been, an, <laughs> and by the, way, by the way, I'm not a Labour supporter, but I won't be voting Tory either. It wouldn't make you a bad person if you were. So. Yeah. Ian Duncan Smith, right. a quick response. I agree with her. Uh, that was the whole point. It's, it's, no, 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 uh, no, it's not hypocrisy because, you know, policies are made and sometimes you can agree and disagree with them, even in your own party. I did not agree with the process that took place. For three years I've been coming here to say that's exactly my position. Hypocrisy is when you say that and then you agree it. I don't. You, you did agree to all the cuts to local authority funding. Well, I, but hang on a second. I don't think that has anything to do with, it, with actually chasing. It does not. It does. I'm sorry. I, I don't agree with you on that. There is absolutely no reason why local authorities cannot get after those that they know and established as rogue landlords. I, I'm, no, I'm not going to agree with you on this. Local authorities have used that as an excuse for doing nothing. That is the absolute truth. They were not cut in that funding, uh, and that is an excuse that they make, and I'm sorry, it's nonsense. All right, gentlemen up there. Hi, um, you mentioned the housing crisis earlier. Could you give a more definitive um, example of what that crisis is? Because we've talked about affordability. Actually, if you look at affordability at the moment, on upfront costs such as deposit and stamp duty as a multiple of your wage, it's about the same as it's always been. It's maybe slightly higher. And if you look at affordability in terms of monthly servicing costs, so that's your mortgage, in relation to your salary, actually that is bang on where it's been for the last 60 years. Why do you feel that we've got a housing crisis and not enough houses are being right, built good, when thanks. we've got lots of empty homes I've got the question. that aren't being utilised? Gavin, you were the one that used the phrase housing crisis. Well, we simply do have a housing crisis. It, the, the trouble with it is it isn't uniform. So whatever your experience is in, in the microclimate that you operate in might well be the norm. It might well be acceptable and it might well be affordable. But we need to build a quarter of a million homes every year and we don't build anywhere near that. But also the reality is we need to build homes that are rental homes and live in and around the infrastructure of a city centre. And we don't build enough of them, anywhere near enough. It's the reason rental levels are spiking in most of the city centres. And it's also the reason that cap values in Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, Bristol have shot up over the last four or five years. And it, the, 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 the process has made even more frustrated, even more strangled by the fact that rules, as Ian rightly pointed out before, brought in to effectively quash off buy to let to provide more property for home ownership. What, it, what, what got forgotten in that analysis, because frankly it got sneaked up on us anyway, uh, what got forgotten in that analysis is actually most of the growth in Manchester and Birmingham in particular, our two second cities, comes from buy to let. Either institutional buy, build to, build to rent, or individual buy to let. So I think we should be Yes, looking at simpler ways to make landlords' lives easier and to make it more investable and more attractive as a product. At the end of the day, the private rental sector has gone from being um, less than 10% of the housing stock in the UK in the last 20 years to being more than 20%. It sounds like small percentages, but in, in billions and trillions that number exists. All right. You know? 
we're going to have to leave it there because we've come to the end of our time for this session. I think what you've seen is there's a lot of issues to be resolved, whoever's in power, on housing and property fronts. And I suspect that the election campaign is not going to give too much time to this. So my advice is that when you go to hustings or speak to politicians, ask them about the issues that concern you. Get housing higher up the agenda, and then you might get some worthwhile changes. Before you go, a round of applause for our panel. <laughs>